Uh, and we're going to introduce now our, our final speaker. Um, uh, Jonathan Neal is the International Secretary for the Campaign Against Climate Change. Um, he's the author of a book, and he's, I'm, I'm really sorry, John, the, name, the title of the book's gone out of my head. What is it? Stop Global Warming, Change the World. You got that? Stop Global Warming, Change the World. And he has been absolutely central um, in, in the support and the actions that have taken place, I'm sure Matt would agree, uh, on the island this week at Leicester. So, Jonathan. I've seen things in the last two weeks that I have not seen since I was a young man. I knew that this country was changing really last week Thursday <coughs> because the meetings, the small meetings we were having in people's houses of a workforce who had been relentlessly bullied who were had by this point 200 people keeping the secret that they were going to occupy, but you were still having to have small meetings so that it would not get out. I think it was Thursday when the people in the meetings really, I knew they were going to go for it. And the way I knew they were going to go for it is, so, is that they stopped talking about the arguments and the impediments and the details of the logistics and they started saying to each other how really scared they were of doing this. <laughs> and how they thought the other workers wouldn't support them because they'd want the redundancy money. And how, af how afraid they were of things they couldn't even say what they were. And nobody left the room. And at the end of the meeting they said, who's going to go and talk to whose shift? tomorrow and how are we going to get them in the next meeting and then I knew that these were serious people because I remembered from my youth that that's how workers talk when they're seriously going to go into action and then from the from the moment we went in they went in and I was sitting outside in the solidarity group outside it was growing and growing and growing you know, all the people they thought wouldn't support them, they all supported them. And the people, the people who were going on about there's no point in doing anything because I want my redundancy money, were all there cheering them like crazy. And they were cheering them like crazy, I think, for a simple reason. It was put in one of the meetings in somebody's house on Sunday. One of the guys there said, we have been shat on all our lives. Yeah. <laughs> and... It's time to stand up. Yeah. And it was seeing people stand up. And this week, I've been sitting there and I've been thinking about the four young black men who walked into a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in the spring of 1960 and asked for a cup of coffee. And I've been thinking that what I'm seeing is the beginning of another set of sit-ins. And like Seamus says, it's global. The Korean car factory that's occupied. Today we got a text from them asking people, investors, to send them a statement of solidarity. Um, but I don't just want to talk about the fight for jobs and the fight for dignity. Because this the the other half of this is the fight for the environment, the fight against climate change. Why this matters so much. We have now a climate emergency. And the emergency is that there is an enormous gap between what the scientists are telling us must be done and what all the governments of the world are talking about doing. And that gap must be closed. And there is no possibility of negotiation on closing that gap. It's not like trade unions, you go into negotiation. You do not negotiate with a hurricane. It comes at you. So we must change what the governments are doing. The reason that we must change it is that we face somewhere down the line, and scientists aren't sure where, 10 or 20 years from now, maybe we've got 50 years, maybe we only have a year, but the best guess is 10 or 20 years, the threat of abrupt climate change. Won't go into how they know about it, but it's from the geological history and drilling and um, ice packs and so on. 
that previously when the world has warmed, it goes up and up and up pretty steadily. And so does the carbon dioxide, the temperature of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then there's suddenly an explosion in both the carbon dioxide and the temperature. I'll give you one example. In Greenland, the, well, the change from the last ice age, 10,660 years ago, to the warm period the world was in when I was born, that change from the ice age in Greenland, half of it happened in three years. More typically, it's 10 or 20 years. But that's the fear. The fear is not one Hurricane Katrina, not one cyclone like the one that put half of Bangladesh underwater two years ago, not one drought like the one across the Sahel that has produced the famines since the 1970s. Um, not one set of forest fires like the ones in Greece. Not one city going underwater, never to be rebuilt like New Orleans. But New York and Shanghai and many great cities in the world going underwater and how the world will cope, what that will mean for human beings. It is entirely guesswork, entirely guesswork. But a reasonable guess is that hundreds of millions will die. Human beings will pick up and go on. We are the dominant species. But the people who live through that time will be permanently scarred by what they must do and what they must see in order to survive. What climate change will mean above all else is three things. First of all, it will mean famine because the rains will change to too much rain and too little rain and the rain patterns are moving. It will mean famine in large parts of the world. Secondly, it will mean enormous surges of refugees who will come up against borders patrolled by armed men and women with machine guns. And the refugee camps will stretch for miles and last for years. And on the other side of the border, there will be an explosion of new kinds of racism to justify keeping those poor desperate people. And climate change will mean war. We already see that in Darfur, where poor farmers and poor shepherds kill each other for grass. But it will mean war in many places in the world. Because if you change the geographical balance of power, the great powers and the small powers will go to war to restore it. And we are living now through the wars for oil. We will live through the wars for water. That's what it means if we don't stop it, but we can stop it. We have the technology all 